I just got back from shooting a video and I was disassembling my FX30 and I decided this might be a good chance to take a step back and tell you how I rigged out my FX30 specifically for this shoot. This was a longer shoot with some branded content. If you would like to see some behind the scenes stuff, let me know in the comments down below and uh, maybe I'll take like a second or third shooter and film some behind the scenes stuff. But back to the FX30. I took this camera and this was my A camera for the entire shoot. I rigged up the FX30 in two different ways. The first one was a small lightweight kit that I could just get some quick B-roll and insert shots and then move on to the next one and just kind of crank out as many shots as I possibly could. The next way I rigged this camera out was the complete opposite. I had all day battery life, wireless audio, a bigger monitor so I could see everything clearer. So let's go over both of those and we'll clear all this stuff off and start with the lightweight kit. I used a few different lenses, but my main lens, even though this is a full frame lens on a crop body, was the 50 millimeter 1.2. This is my, oh my God. Even though this is a full frame lens, I was using it on a crop body and it was slightly tighter, but also the performance of these linear XD motors on the 50 millimeter 1.2 is really good at locking onto, in my case, I was using the eye detection and it was sticking onto eyes very well. Um, I have a whole video going over the 50 millimeter 1.2, so I won't talk about it too much. You may notice for my lightweight rig, I only have three things that I was using. And I wasn't using the cage for this. I was actually using the NATO rail that comes with the small rig cage, um, or you can just buy a separate NATO rail. It doesn't have to be the one that comes with the cage. But I like using this for just the speed of NATO and how secure those mounts actually are, especially when it comes to monitor mounts. For our monitor mount, we're actually using the small rig articulating arm, one side has a NATO mount that will attach to our camera, and then the other side has a quarter 20 that we will attach to the cage of our Ninja 5. If you also have the cage of the Ninja 5, you can swap this mount out for another NATO mount. So if you're having any kind of problems with, uh, you know, not being able to get this quarter 20 tight enough into the cage of the Ninja 5, it's way faster to just buy another articulating arm that's the NATO mount and just use that directly to the cage of our Ninja 5. So one of my tricks when I'm attaching a quarter 20 to the cage of my Ninja 5, I wouldn't do this directly into my Ninja 5, but into the cage of the Ninja 5, I like to get it as tight as I can. And then I'll actually turn the cage of my Ninja 5 and make it even tighter. So now it is very secure. The beauty of an articulating arm is that you can loosen it and you can now move it in any direction and you can put it in front if you're, you know, filming behind the camera. But if you want to show, you know, whoever you're filming, like if you're filming a macro shot and you can see what you're filming on the back, but the talent needs to, you know, hold something up in the air at a very specific angle and they can't see it on the screen, well, you can just loosen the articulating arm and show them the feed of what you're looking at. One lifesaver this had in my previous shoot was we were using a product and the talent was moving the product whenever they were talking and it was a macro shot of the product. So it was constantly going out of frame. So I just turned the monitor around and said, hey, check this out, keep the product in frame and when they could see a feed of what they were actually doing, it wasn't for screwdrivers, but um, <laughs> they could actually keep the product in frame and level. And I wasn't trying to sit there and hunt and follow the product. They could just sit there and keep it in frame themselves and see what they were doing. And, you know, they could actually see the product. And if the sunlight reflected off of it in a weird way. I didn't have to convey to them, oh, we have to reshoot that, there was a weird glare. They just knew, oh, wait, there was a glare there, let's reshoot that. For power, I was just using the NPF Z100 batteries and the NPF 100 batteries for the monitor and the camera. This was my B-roll setup and it was so light that it was very easy to move around quickly, get a shot, move to the next scene, get that shot and just check things off of our checklist very quickly. I didn't have to have tons of external power because the shoot was so short that day. However, when we came back, 
we were filming tons of long form content. So I needed to rig this camera out in a little different way um, that I wouldn't be worrying about battery life and we were recording audio. So I had to take care of that. So let's take this apart and I will actually show you my larger setup that I used for more all day filming. To start off our larger FX30 build, I'll start by putting my camera in a cage. This is the small rig cage, and I like this because it has a 45 degree cold shoe adapter that will be uh, very helpful later in the build. It also has a HDMI lock on the side. And putting the FX30 or the FX3 in a cage is so much nicer than putting uh, the other you know, Sony Alpha cameras in a cage because you don't have to take off that side um, neck strap adapter and then put it to the side and then you end up losing it. Like I've lost almost all of my Sony Alpha camera uh, neck strap, those like little silver hook things. So uh, I always have to buy like replacement ones, but the FX3 and FX30 cage has just three screws, one on the side, one on the bottom, and then one on the other side by the HDMI clamp. One thing I do dislike about this cage though, if you're using the HDMI clamp, um, that's fine. But if you're not using it and it's not all the way unloosened, it'll actually make this rattling noise whenever you're moving the camera around. So, um, I mean, this can be fixed by just unloosening the camera HDMI clamp all the way uh, and it won't rattle. But if you do leave it a little bit unloosened, it rattles and it drives me crazy. So make sure um, you're using the HDMI clamp or you just have it all the way loosened if you're not using it. So now that our camera's in the cage, let's start by adding our rails to the bottom. And since this is a smaller footprint camera, I went with actually smaller rails and a smaller base plate this time. One thing to note here, I'm putting my camera smack dab on the base plate because I won't be pulling it on and off of these rails with my V-mount battery. If you wanna check out my a7 IV or a7S III videos, uh, I do use a Arca Swiss quick release plate before putting it on the base plate, but for this one, I won't be taking them on and off. So I'm just putting the camera straight on the base plate. Another nice thing about attaching this base plate to the uh, camera cage and not directly to your camera is the cage has two points of contact so I can put my camera on there and when I have two points of contact my base plate it's not going to shift side to side. So that's another reason that I'm a big fan of uh, putting cages on my camera. But the next thing we'll add is the V-mount power. And for this build I also went with a smaller V-mount battery plate. Um, because all of the batteries I've been using lately actually have DTAP and USB-C power delivery out ports like this FX Lion Nano 3. So I've been actually attaching this battery straight to the plate and not needing a powered plate like my previous rig videos when I had batteries that didn't have this USB-C power delivery. These batteries are more expensive, but I find that I can charge these with USB-C and I don't have to charge them via DTAP. So it's just easier for me because I always have a USB-C cable laying around. I don't always have that charging DTAP cable. If you don't have V-mount batteries that have the USB-C power delivery though, and you're picking up the larger, cheaper batteries that only have USB-C and DTAP, I would pick up a powered battery plate because you're gonna have more options to power your whole rig if you have the powered battery plate to be connecting your devices to. Um, this one is about as basic as it gets. It's just kind of a V-mount cheese plate adapter to connected to some rail mounts. Um, let's put this on, it's pretty straightforward. And one thing that I always forget to do is actually flip out your screen and then put your V-mount battery adapter on the back of your camera. I always um, would forget to flip my screen out or if I wanted to flip it back in, um, I had another more expensive V-mount battery adapter that had an articulating arm on it. I think I used it in my uh, a7 IV rig video. So um, if you wanna check that one out, that is more expensive. So if you have those cheaper batteries, maybe you can get a more expensive V-mount battery plate to kind of power your whole rig. Um, but this one is about as cheap as it gets, like I said, and it's nice because it's just a cheese plate on some rail mounts. So you can put this on and it's very sturdy. So now we can attach our V-mount battery to the back. And like I said, I'll just be using my V-mount battery inputs to power all of my devices. Another thing I attach to all of my cameras is a top handle. I like having a top handle not only for another 
you know, way to grab your camera, especially once you start powering all these devices, there's a lot of wires and stuff hanging around. And after this is tight, I can attach my articulating arm, but this time I will be actually flipping this around. So this is why I got this um, specific um, articulating arm. Instead of getting two NATOs, I got one NATO so I can go to my monitor. And then this time I'll actually be using the quarter 20 to attach to one of these quarter 20 mounting points on the top handle. I've used the ones on the side here, but uh, for this one, I'll actually put it on the top. So there are plenty of quarter 20 mounts to choose from. And uh, again, like I said, my little trick to get this really tight because uh, you know, this isn't going into a camera, it's going, you know, metal to metal into a top handle. I can really kind of wrench this thing on and make sure it doesn't twist around. I'll turn it uh, as tight as I can get it and leave it about 45 degrees. And then when this is locked, I'll actually turn the whole thing and really secure it in. So now if I'm out using my monitor, um, you know, and I'm, you know, moving the camera around, it's not going to actually move my monitor. What's one of my biggest pet peeves is when my monitor breaks loose whenever I'm filming something, it just is a terrible feeling. So now I will use the NATO rail on the bottom of my monitor mount to the NATO rail on the top mount here. And like I said, this just screws right on and that is very secure. I've been using the DJI mics for my wireless audio and I've had a great experience with them so far. Taking the receiver out of the case um, it's already charged up and on, but also you can put it into the 45 degree cold shoe mount that's right next to the 3.5 millimeter in for your camera. So that makes it really easy to run your audio straight into your camera and you're not needing to like route all of your audio cables around all of your power cables and it just kind of gets to be a nightmare. I like having the audio right where it needs to be, so I'm not routing a bunch of audio cables around my power cables and HDMI cables. So um, now with our wireless audio on, we can take our receivers out and just start recording audio and the audio is going directly into our camera. One other thing about this cage that I am not a fan of is that this cold shoe adapter with this DJI mic for some reason, it's just a little tiny bit loose. So if you are really running out and you snag this cable, you have the possibility of actually taking this DJI mic out of the cold shoe adapter. Um, I haven't had that happen to me, but I knew that. And so I was using this um, top handle specifically because it has a cold shoe adapter in the back. So you can actually put this um, cold shoe adapter into the DJI mic and now it is very secure since the cold shoe is going like a U and you're just putting this straight down. So gravity is keeping it down. Sorry to go on a tangent of uh, mic placement, but I just thought it was something worth noting. Next, we will add all of our cables and we will start by powering our camera with our V-mount battery. Another reason I like using the USB-C power delivery is that if we have our camera turned on and for some reason our power delivery gets interrupted, we still have a battery in the camera. If we were using a dummy battery, this power would be interrupted and if we're filming, our file would be corrupt. However, if we have a camera battery in the camera still, it'll just pull over to that internal power and keep recording even if our external power gets interrupted. The more I talk, the more I lose my voice. <laughs> the next thing we'll be powering up is our monitor. And in our case, we're using the Ninja 5. And this comes with the um, DC barrel connector to NPF battery plate. So we'll be using a, I think this is an Alvin's cable uh, barrel connector uh, DC power to DTAP. So I'll link this in the description down below. Um, I just found this cable and I'm a very big fan of it. Before I was using um, kind of a cheaper cable. Um, not that this is one is like super expensive, but it is a more premium cable for a DTAP cable that I've ever used. So with our DTAP side into our FX Lion Nano 3, we will coil this around the handle once and then plug the locking side into our uh, Ninja 5 battery plate. And this is nice because uh, it has that locking adapter just like the original Atomos one does. So um, your power is secure to your Ninja 5. 
So next we will take our HDMI cable from our camera to our monitor. This should be a simple process, but I have a couple of different uh, HDMI cables that depending on what I'll be doing with this um, rig, I actually use different ones. So uh, the first one I have is the tried and true uh, Condor Blue HDMI cable. So if I'm keeping this uh, monitor pretty close to my camera and I won't be moving it, I will use this Condor Blue HDMI cable. And this one is capable of shooting ProRes RAW to the Ninja 5. If I will be moving my camera around, I'll actually use a little bit longer of a cable. And if, you know, on the last shoot, I used this cable and uh, you don't need a right angle cable, but it does keep things a little bit more tidy. So I plugged the right angle cable into my Ninja 5, and then I just had some extra slack, um, probably not the best practice, probably could have got a little bit shorter of a cable, but um, I just wrapped it around the handle a little bit, probably not the best wire management, but um, I wrapped it around the handle and then plugged my HDMI cable in and then clamped this HDMI cable down. So that is secure. And this was nice because if I had to move my monitor uh, with the other tighter cables, the cable management is better, but also I am not able to move my monitor around in any orientation that I want to because the monitor cable is just too tight with the HDMI. With all of this extra slack, um, it doesn't look very nice. However, when you go to move your monitor around to show someone what you're filming, it is way easier and it doesn't put as much stress on all of these ports. Um, I had this HDMI cable left over from another uh, larger build for my FX6. So it really uh, is maybe a little bit too long for this one. I'll link this one in the description below, this right angle cable, and uh, maybe there'll be like a shorter option that you could purchase, but I'm a very big fan of uh, this specific right angle cable because it is going the right way, that it's coming 90 degrees out of your monitor and coming straight down. I purchased other 90 degree cables before and it was the other way. It was 90 degrees and it was going straight up, so um, that cable management wasn't very tidy. I'm not saying this is any better, but um, I've actually used this one. I am not able to record ProRes RAW with this 90 degree cable though. If you need to record ProRes RAW, I would say the safest bet is to pick up the Condor Blue cable. This isn't sponsored by Condor Blue. I rarely find myself anymore shooting um, ProRes RAW. I find myself shooting the um, all eye codec. So it's nice just coming straight out of the camera that it's a big enough file that I can use uh, in color grade and really have a lot of latitude there. So this is the FX30 build. This is the exact build that I used to shoot my last project with. And I challenged myself to shoot with the FX30 because I'm so used to shooting with uh, my FX6 or my A7S3 or FX3. Shooting on a smaller sensor doesn't mean you're going to get smaller results. The image coming off of this sensor is fantastic. As long as you know the drawbacks, you can't rely on the low light performance of the other full frame Sony cameras as much as you can with this one. And you might get a little less background blur. But other than that, it is still a fantastic camera that you can get fantastic results with. Also, if you would like to see some more behind the scenes content, let me know in the comments down below. I've always wanted to make some more behind the scenes content, but uh, it just get caught up in gear and kind of, you know, shiny object syndrome. So uh, that's the videos that I kind of tend to make on this channel. Never uh, how I intended this channel to go, but um, that's just kind of the, the path I've been taking lately. So if you'd like to see more behind the scenes content of, you know, me actually shooting stuff and like what I'm doing and maybe like the reasons why I'm doing certain things, uh, let me know in the comments down below and uh, I would love to make those videos. I just wanna say thank you guys for sticking around to the end and I'll see you in the next one.